Uh, my name is Brooke Edmonds, and I am with Extension in Oregon State University. And I have a little introduction before we have our speakers take it away and share their screen. So we have two speakers today. Our first speaker is Jay Scheip. Uh, he's a professor and Extension plant pathology specialist at Oregon State University. His principal duties are to lead a statewide extension program related to the diagnosis and management of diseases of all fruit, nut, and ornamental nursery crops. He's also the co-editor of the Pacific Northwest Plant Disease Management Handbook, which many of you may use in your own plant clinics. And our second speaker is Cassie Bosky. Cassie is an assistant professor at Oregon State University, and she serves as the agriculture extension faculty for Coos and Curry counties, where she works with commercial horticulture, home horticulture, livestock and dairy, and also small farm producers in those counties. So we'll have Jay is gonna kick us off and have him share his screen and unmute his mic. So she's already introduced me and I'll just get moving right along here with uh, these slides. Uh, yeah, I do uh, statewide uh, master gardeners and uh, basically woody ornamentals as well as uh, other uh, woody crops as well as what we uh, focus in on. Uh, she's already mentioned that we do the plant disease handbook this insect book is eclipsing me get out of here i don't do insects and i do. there's the weed book too okay so yeah well, there's three sister books insect weeds i do the plant disease book in combination with uh, in, in uh, my colleague uh, uh, dr cindy yokum so uh, this is also available online as many of you may know uh, this online version has color pictures in it which is always kind of nice i will also uh, so if you don't really uh, don't quite catch what's going on uh, today you can't see the recording uh, just go to the handbook go to the boxwood blight section there you'll get all the information uh, that's up to date there there's also some links to additional information over there in the right hand column that you'll find there so that's uh, just a quick uh, way to get the information uh, you know boxwoods have a lot of different problems uh, probably the most common one is volutella leaf and stem blight very common here I uh, have uh, You'll notice the leaves are on the stems there, the necrotic leaves there. A lot of times they'll stay on and they'll have uh, this pinkish coloration to them. The sporulation of the fungus is on the underside of the leaves. You can see that in that right-hand picture there with that pink coloration there. Uh, there's some other disease problems too. This is uh, Phytophthora crown and root rot. You know, it looks kind of the same as the other one there. Uh, the problem here, and uh, what I do want you to notice is that the leaves are on the plants. The, they're on the uh, shoots there. They haven't uh, come off of there. A lot of times when we have these plant diseases killing shoots, they, the leaves won't form an abscission layer and fall off. So they stay on there and they're very obvious. Of course, with a root rot problem, the main problem where you're gonna see the vascular discoloration is down in the roots or around the root crown area. And with Phytophthora root rot, like you see on the right there, you'll also see stunting, uh, some scattered uh, uh, areas and an association with poorly drained fields as well. Uh, this picture came in this summer. Uh, a landscaper wanted to know whether he had boxwood blight or not. Two things told me it wasn't boxwood blight. We'll get into boxwood blight in just a moment. Notice the leaves are on the shoots and also notice that it's each and every bush on down the line there. And that makes me think maybe it's something a little more, uh, something to do with management, something to do with environment. I posted this on Facebook because I didn't know what was going on in this particular one. I knew it wasn't Blockswood blight, but uh, some of the report, uh, replies back from the landscapers were that this was due to power tools. So if you're doing some power hedging, power uh, pruning, the exhaust from the uh, power pruner or the heat from it uh, is what the problem was in this particular case. Several people uh, mentioned that that would be a problem and that lines up very well with it being a problem all the way uh, down the line here. Well, let's get the boxwood blight itself. Uh, the fungus name uh, that uh, originally started here is uh, Calonectria pseudonaviculata. This is a great image by Luisa Santa Maria. Uh, you can see it's basically a leaf spotter. So we have this dark leaf spot. Sometimes the center turns a, a bit uh, a tan. The outer 
part of the leaf also turns sort of a light brown color. I'll have some more pictures of that uh, as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my little pointer here. Uh, somebody will give me a thumbs up if they can see that pointer running around. Yeah, okay. And you can see there are some stem lesions as well. And that's what characterizes this particular uh, plant disease. Uh, now the history of this is such that uh, we didn't find it first. This has been going on in Europe for quite a long while. 1994 is when it hit the United Kingdom. New Zealand was dealing with it in 98. Uh, and uh, here's some more pictures uh, that uh, our, our colleagues in uh, uh, Europe are allowing us to use here. I, I thank them quite a bit. Again, you see the necrotic spots that are on the leaves, sort of a, a light brown halo around some of those uh, leaf spots as well. Uh, but there's also these stem lesions, okay? So you can see these as well uh, with a nice dark border around those stem lesions. Uh, yeah, so it's a leaf spotter and a defoliator will fall off those uh, stems. The defoliation can be quite severe as we get into sort of nursery situations. And yeah, as you can see here, there's not a whole lot of leaves left on those uh, plants there. And it's not just a nursery problem, but it's in the landscape as well uh, that you can see. As you can see it here on these uh, uh, bushes uh, uh, that they're uh, showing here. It's not every bush here, but it's more severe in some spots than others. These are the sorts of characters uh, that you would be looking for. Uh, there's a few other odds and ends here about how uh, we're naming this thing. I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, in uh, the 2000s, then it spread throughout Western Europe to a point where it was just common everywhere. Uh, it got to a point in England that they really have a hard time growing English boxwood in England. It's kind of interesting. They're actually thinking of a replacement plant, such as um, I think it's a small leaf or a little leaf holly uh, that has similar growth characteristics. But uh, anyway, that's how bad boxwood blight has gotten in Europe. Uh, it popped into the Republic of Georgia in 2010, but in 2011 is when it hit North America, including Oregon. We'll show you some of that in a little bit. We hit the nursery growers a lot. By the way, this is a poll. Uh, this is not for you to respond to. This is one that I uh, did with a, a group of landscapers that I was talking to. Uh, we hit our nursery industry very hard with lots of information on this. But I was really surprised about the landscapers. Uh, this was a talk to the Portland Parks people. And I thought I'd put up a few uh, questions to them, to this group, as the room was quite full of people. Uh, was uh, boxwood blight something they were aware of and looking for? What I really wanted to know was whether they were dealing with it or not, uh, because I knew there were a few spots that had it. And I threw C in there just for the heck of it, uh, that maybe a few people didn't know what boxwood blight was uh, quite yet. I, I was totally surprised. Half of them had no idea what this was. And I think this is a big group of people that we've basically missed and that we're trying to hit now uh, on this subject because this is where it's probably going to be spreading and being even more of a problem is in our landscapes. Uh, we had a, a meeting uh, about this, uh, uh, basically lots of people from the United States going to North Carolina. Uh, we invited some people from that were dealing with this uh, from Europe. Uh, you can see uh, there's uh, uh, Bjorn uh, here on the one side and the Luisa Santa Maria on the other. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to show you was because we had people coming from all over the country and this was a very new disease, we knew it was very easy to spread it around. You'll notice they have screens in the background there. They set up this research plot and they screened it in so that animals would not move this around to uh, other spots. You'll also notice they're wearing these Tyvek suits so that they wouldn't get it on their clothes and move it around that way. Everybody had to wear these uh, rubber booties uh, or these uh, plastic booties uh, so it wouldn't move it. And when we uh, exited, we all washed our hands with sanitizer. Uh, I don't think you have to be quite so intense with it. We were just being cautious so that we didn't move it to uh, many other states uh, at that particular time. Um, we're going to go over some of the biology here uh, before we go into uh, control. Again, I'm going to use some of the slide sets uh, uh, that our uh, uh, colleagues in Europe uh, are allowing us to use here. Uh, they did find that there are two different kinds of the fungus. Based, for all intents and purposes, they, the fungi look exactly the same, but one of them has a little bit of a difference to it. They've renamed these things, so it's uh, the, the one is Calinectria pseudonaviculata. The other has a species name of Henry Cotia there. Uh, that one has fungicide resistance, and that's what identifies it as a little different than the other ones. We'll get to fungicides here uh, in just a moment.
So yeah, a, a lot of you don't have um, microscopic capabilities, uh, but if you're looking for the leaf spots, that's one thing. If you kind of dig into those plants and start looking for these stem lesions, that's another. If you get a, if you, some of you have a dissecting scope or you might have a hand lens that you can use, you can begin to see some of the sporulation on the underside of the leaves. Notice this is white. It's not pink like the volutella, but it's a white sporulation on there. Here it is on some uh, stems and leaves. You'll sort of see this white pin cushions uh, on there. That's also very diagnostic of this particular uh, disease. You get the light microscope out and get really close here. Uh, you can see the spores all kind of gathered together here. They kind of look like a uh, ooh, a stack of hot dogs together there. There's also these spear looking things here. These aren't uh, structures that are spores. They're not going to distribute uh, the fungus around, but these spores will do that. Both the spears and the spores here are diagnostic of this particular disease there. Uh, the black arrow is just showing uh, one of those uh, uh, spear structures, uh, just an ornate structure uh, that's characteristic of this fungus. And then the white arrow here is showing where those uh, spores, these sticky spores are produced. And if we get even closer yet, you'll see that each one of these has septation uh, in there. I don't expect a lot of you to uh, have uh, access to a microscope to see that, but that's what the plant clinic would be doing if we're confirming uh, uh, these particular uh, sticky spores that are on there. Oh, here's one of our diagnosticians who has uh, dressed up for Halloween and she's dressed up as box wood blight. And you can see she has the characteristic white spores here with the septation. Yeah, okay, it's very detailed uh, and done very well. Okay, uh, some of the other research that's been done on this disease uh, is to find out how they're distributed. Is it airborne or is it splash dispersed? We weren't really sure which way it was. Uh, the researchers in Europe found very uh, predictably if, with uh, their, that green line here, the reliable uh, threshold there, they only got a reliable spore counts when they had rainfall. So when they weren't getting rain, they really weren't seeing uh, viable spores, which also which supports the idea that these things are not windborne, but that they are uh, rain splashed. To do some more research on that, they looked at, um, and I'm just looking at the diagrams here, we have these red circles, these red dots uh, indicating infected plants, and then we have these green circles indicating healthy plants, and they were seeing how quickly or how much the disease spread to the green plants. And you can see they had uh, either zero space uh, between them, uh, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters. The idea is if it's rain splashed, then the larger the distance, then I should get less disease. If it's airborne, then it really shouldn't matter with these small distances between uh, the others. And, and what they found uh, was the first case that as they increased the distance, they had less disease uh, uh, on these particular plants. The disease progress curves continued to increase, but less so if they were uh, a, a distance from those infected plants. So yeah, it's uh, rain splashed. And I just wanted to show you the research setup here in this particular uh, picture or image here on the left side. You see where how far these different plants and these different uh, blocks are from one another to try to isolate and protect uh, each of the various experiments that they were uh, conducting. Uh, so this is more important for uh, nurseries, but it'll come back to us a little later. So to get in your mind, the idea that these sticky spores are being splashed around, uh, being uh, liberated and splashed around during rainstorms. That's when it gets going. Okay. Uh, this was first found in the fall of 2011. And since we just talked about splash dispersal, guess what also happened in 2012, 2011? Yeah, the, the East Coast, which is where we found a lot of this, had a hurricane come through. This isn't Sandy. Sandy actually came in the next year, uh, 2012, is when that one came in uh, and went right through the area where we first found boxwood blight. And at the time, I made some predictions that we would begin to see boxwood blight then in the surrounding states. So let's take a look here. Yeah, 2011, found it in Oregon, as well as these states here on the East Coast. By 2013, yeah, there it is in New York and Ohio. By 2014, it's here, Georgia, and some other states. Uh, 2015, others. And by 2016, uh, these uh, Illinois here and uh, what is that, uh, South Carolina. Uh, yeah, also uh, showing up in Washington. That wasn't a big surprise. In 2011, we found it in not only Oregon, but also some nurseries in British Columbia. So it's not too far a cry that we have it here 
uh, in uh, Washington as well, and it also showed up in California. Cassie will have a little bit more to say on where it's occurring uh, in Oregon in uh, just a minute. What I want to do is go over some of the research looking at uh, not just spore liberation, but spore infection process. Uh, yeah, this is some European data, and so I kind of uh, took the liberty of made it a little more uh, friendly for uh, North America here. Number of hours of leaf wetness versus temperature in Fahrenheit. What I want you to notice is that uh, right about here, 54 degrees Fahrenheit and a whole day, 24 hours of continuous wetness, we still don't get infection by this particular fungus. Once we get into the 60s and 70s, oh yeah, we get plenty of infection uh, no matter how wet it is there. But in our typical spring conditions, which is uh, our young, youngest leaves are most susceptible to that, oh, it's gotta be wet uh, for more than 24 hours by you know two days worth, seven days worth uh, at relatively warm temperatures uh, for our springs. Does that ever happen in Oregon? Why, of course it does. Once in a while, we do get weather conditions like that. Sometimes we call these things pineapple expresses. Here's one in 2005, occurred uh, March 25, 26, 27. 84 hours continuous leaf wetness. A, a pineapple express is basically a, the jet stream lines up from uh, Hawaii and just dumps a river of wetness into the Pacific Northwest. And we can be wet for quite a long period. The longest one I have ever measured is 102 hours uh, during our springtime. So certainly we can easily get uh, infection uh, uh, naturally uh, in our uh, boxwoods if blight uh, is there. Uh, we've taken this information and put it into uh, a form that you can uh, investigate your particular site. So whether you're uh, in the Portland area or you're out there in uh, Pilot Rock, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can take this information and find out whether weather conditions have been uh, conducive for you. And Cassie's going to go and uh, run through this for you uh, shortly. So yeah, there's these nasty sticky spores that stick to all sorts of things, uh, but we also have what we call microsclerosis. So there's one other sort of spore type to worry about. These are these little brown dots that you see in that Petri plate. If you look at a leaf, there's also microsclerosia there in the leaves, and they are going to last in there. This is a, a, a group of cells, a group of brown cells. It's a survival structure. They'll survive in those leaves that fall to the ground for five years. That's right, five years. And so you can imagine sanitation type tactics that are going to be important later on. Okay, so I know you've all been listening, but what, what do you really need to know about this? And hey, Kelly, Kelly Ivers, are you out there? Uh, would you tell us uh, what these people need to know? And it's great. What do you mean? Oh, oh, you're, what you're were they? Me? What were they? Are you, are you what recording? were they? All, what, what, what were all the things that a grower is supposed to know? <laughs> um, <laughs> microsclerosia <laughs> formation, <laughs> um, survivability in the landscape, um, the uh, rain events, and oh, flash dispersed <laughs> and not in air currents. Great, Kelly. Thank you very much. So, what do you need to know? Yeah, sticky spores on leaves and stems and that these things are splash dispersed so during rainstorms and the rainstorms to get infection it needs to really be warm and wet not just the cool and wet that we sometimes get in our springs but warm and wet and then there's these microsclerosia that are just sitting in those fallen leaves and these in there for for many many years okay so what i like to do is i'm going to move on to principles of plant disease management i usually like to talk about the five methods exclusion avoidance eradication protection and resistance if you're a nursery and you're online now uh, go to the oregon department of agriculture's website there's a nursery cleanliness program program for boxwood blight Go and take a look at that. It's a little more detailed than I'm going to go into uh, today. The top three management, um, important management factors to this disease are fungicides, finding the most effective ones, finding resistant cultivars, and cultural controls using sanitation. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, these are the different ones we're going to go through then. Uh, exclusion, isolate new material for 30 days. So you buy a new boxwood plant, you don't know if it's infected or not, don't put it right next to your susceptible boxwoods. Isolate it for a month, inspect it very closely, and see if you find the problem or not. If you do find the problem, yeah, now you've saved uh, yourself a whole lot of headaches by not moving it into your regular uh, boxwood area. Avoidance. If you do bring in these new ones, make sure it's 10 feet from anything else. A little bit more for uh, 
uh, nurseries there. Uh, sanitation measures, uh, fungicides, and tolerant cultivars. I'm going to go through those uh, now. So sanitation, yeah, those leaves that are defoliating, falling off the thing, you're off the uh, bush, you're going to have to uh, clean these things up uh, and get rid of them. Send them to landfill, uh, burn them up, uh, things like, or bury them. These are the types of things that uh, we need to be doing. If you have boxwood blight in a landscape situation, uh, raking or blowing those, that leaf material out of there and cleaning that up will be uh, helpful at reducing disease pressure. I want you to sort of notice, this is that research site in North Carolina, notice how clean that gravel site is. There's almost no leaves on the ground there and they want to keep it that way. I don't know if they vacuumed this thing or not, but boy, they did a really good job uh, on sanitation in this particular spot. Uh, and you'll also notice, yeah, everybody's got their uh, Tyvek suits on uh, and the screens, but uh, the idea is that potentially uh, animals could, because it's sticky spores, they might be able to move it uh, naturally. Here are, you see the defoliation here. It's all these leaves down here that we want to take care of. But you also need to get rid of these stem lesions as well. So you want to remove those uh, and dispose of those stem lesions as well because it will sporulate uh, on the stem lesions as well. They did do some flaming so we could burn up that leaf tissue that's on the ground with these uh, handheld flamers uh, that you can get at uh, stores for uh, weed control, uh, weed dehydration, I guess they do, but you can also burn up uh, these things and burn up the microsclerotia that are in the fallen leaves. Uh, they did some experiments with that. It wasn't completely successful. I think if you use this along with integrating it into many other uh, tactics that you might use that it, it would be successful as a, 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 an IPM type uh, approach of one of many different things that you can use to try to clean up uh, the situation. What I really want to get into is pruning. So yeah, sticky spores, your pruners, these pruners could move it from an infected bush over to a non-infected bush. So what I want you to think about here is having a two pruning method. Have one of your pruners sitting in a disinfectant. So you clean your pruners really good, put it in a disinfectant, let it soak there. Don't dip it, let it soak there. The other pruner is already cleaned, you've already soaked it, go ahead and prune a plant, prune a row, whatever you're uh, pruning. And then before you move on to the next uh, bush or the next, uh, row or whatever it happens to be, put that pruner in and then pull the other one out and let it soak there uh, during that time. That's the two methods there. Uh, disinfectants that you can use uh, in the home, Clorox works very well or you can get denatured uh, alcohols. Uh, the Clorox, uh, usually we uh, cut it one to 10. So uh, a 10% solution of Clorox, one part bleach, nine parts water. Uh, it's a great oxidizer and it will oxidize your tools as well, which is why uh, some people want to use the denatured alcohol. That works pretty good. For uh, commercial growers, uh, quaternary ammonias like Green Shield there or uh, peroxides like Zerotol uh, are other materials that uh, people can use as well. I'm not really going to get into fungicides too much for uh, the home garden. This is more for commercial uh, growers. There are home materials, but none of them have boxwood blight on the label. Some of the commercial materials, I got to say this carefully, I got a pesticide license, right? So some of the materials that commercial growers can get, some of those same active ingredients are available in homeowner, small homeowner packaging. It's just that boxwood blight's just not on the label there. Bottom line, go and hire a landscape service. They have access to those uh, types of materials and can do preventative fungicide sprays in the spring and potentially in the fall uh, uh, on your uh, plants if you're worried about it. There are the two different types of fungi and resistance is a problem that uh, is uh, all over Europe uh, and we think it might be developing in North America as well. I don't know of any here uh, in uh, Oregon, uh, but it is a, a possibility as we use uh, more fungicides. A resi resistant cultivars is probably the biggie that we're going to use. So uh, before I talk about resistance, we talk about susceptibility and you'll notice the top three pictures here, very susceptible boxwood cultivars. Uh, there's a list of these that I'll mention in just a moment. Uh, so there's, you see the, the amount of defoliation from very heavy to uh, a little bit lighter here uh, on the right side. Pecky Sandra down here in the lower 
left corner is also susceptible. It will become uh, infected in the landscape, especially if you have infected uh, boxwoods. Sarcococca is uh, that's a nice sweet smelling uh, flower in the, about January. Uh, it's also in the Buxaceae. Experimentally, we can infect it, but we don't normally see it infected in the landscape. So I wouldn't worry too much about Sarcococca. I'd focus in on the boxwoods themselves. Uh, here's that North Carolina data showing you uh, the range of susceptibility, some of them very susceptible types to uh, very resistant types. And so if you're putting in a new hedge, uh, I would default to the more resistant types. They're not going to have nearly a problem with this boxwood blight uh, as the susceptible ones, uh, which will just become defoliated and be a problem for uh, quite some time. Um, so this is, uh, the link is on that website, uh, the handbook website on the uh, right hand column, uh, you'll get the link to this particular data. Now you wanna focus on North American data. Uh, the European data is good, but there's a slight problem there. I think we're gonna hear from some folks about that. Well, we can try it again here and see if we can get him uh, talking. Well, he's not gonna to talk to us, but some of the cultivars in Europe might have a different name than they have here uh, in North America here. Uh, so anyway, here's uh, uh, very susceptible on the left, resistant here on the right. Those are the ones that we wanna be using uh, out there these days. So that's boxwood blight. There's uh, the classic picture that's a textbook picture. It may not look like that exactly in yours, but that's the sort of thing that you wanna look for is these leaf spots, stem lesions, and defoliation, unusual defoliation. If you're not sure, hey, send it to the plant clinic. We'll be able to tell very quickly uh, with that. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it on over to Cassie. Okay, so we've already seen this this graph. Again, I'm Cassie Bosky. I'm an extension agent down in Coos and Curry counties um, on the southwestern coast of Oregon, and I cover pretty much anything that's agriculturally related. So that's my job. Um, so we talked about where it's at in the U.S., and I was going to talk real briefly about where we see boxwood blight in, in Oregon. It's present in four counties that we know of, um, three of which are concentrated up in the Portland and Salem area, Washington, Multnomah, and Marion counties. You can see those here. And then we've got this weird instance down in Coos County, which is why I even have a clue about boxwood blight. Um, but uh, I just want to just want to re reiterate the purpose of this is just to not to create alarmism, but just to give you guys another tool in your toolbox when you're at when people are asking you questions. And um, we I would anticipate seeing more of this in the future. And it just you know another another thing for you to look at um, another possible option for disease problems. So. Um, what I wanted to do is talk through just um, this little case study that we had where, where boxwood blight popped up in Coos County. And uh, I think, um, let's see how we're doing. The, the um, bottom line was uh, <laughs> I was a new agent in 2014, and I don't want to go into a whole big story, but the, the question when it initially got um, call, called into us, our, our for, extension forester at the time answered it because we'd had a big empty spot and we didn't have anybody in horticulture for I don't know a couple of years and he had been handling whatever came in and and just doing the best he can and so he did what you guys do when you get plant clinic questions and he you know he, he tried to get an idea about what the history of the site was what what um, the distribution of the problem was these people were seeing and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, just trying to collect information so he could give his best recommendation um, and he thought initially it was perhaps an environmental issue. This picture is actually from that landscape and it looks terrible. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, they, they checked their watering system, they, they checked their, did the soil test, they checked everything, and in a few months they called us back and I got that phone call. And, um, you know, I, I just, we don't typically do residential site visits uh, just because that could pile up and, uh, there's just too much to do, but um, I made an exception this time and, and went out to see what was going on um, just because, you know, she really wanted to work with us and she wanted to, to find an answer to the problem and it was being, it was a big problem in her landscape. So when I got to the home, 
I found a home landscape that was structured around boxwoods. It was an English garden. Uh, and the bulk of her boxwood plants within that land, garden landscapes were either dead or dying and looked very terrible. And I could see why she was so upset. So um, I took I took down some description description of the of the situation and some photos and sent those to Jay, and who almost immediately got back to me. It was really he's really great. Um, and he said, oh, there's this disease called boxwood blight, and I wonder if that's what you're seeing, which, you know, now that now that I know what I know, yeah, look at that. Holy cow. Um, and it was very odd that it popped up in Coos Bay. They weren't expecting that. No one was expecting it. And um, uh, so I sent some samples in for verification with Department of Ag, and um, we got a positive identification. So... that it was boxwood blight. So we had seen at, on that site just what Jay has talked you through, extreme defoliation. When you looked close at the, um, at the plants themselves, there are a lot of lesions on the stems and on the leaves, and it spread very rapidly from plant to plant. Um, our coastal environment here in Coos Bay, I know 54 degrees is kind of that cutoff, but you know, it's, <laughs> there aren't very many days where we don't break 55 degrees. Um, it's, it's warm a lot down here, so it's a really, if you're a disease, this is a great place to be. We love, they love it here. Um, but this, this couple, we, they were fantastic in, the, in their efforts to um, take care of this problem and get it cleaned up and, and just minimize the, the opportunity for the disease to spread to the neighborhood and through further into other hedge uh, structures in their yard. Um, they they removed all the dead plants and material plants that were dying or looked sick they got rid of um they carefully raked up and collected fallen leaves and other plant material and disposed of it just like jay suggested i'm, I'm not sure if they burned it or if they took it to a um the and, and took it off site but um they did get rid of it and then they put some mulch down over the soil just to minimize you know any any um, of those spores that they'd missed, they didn't want to have, they just wanted to cover that up so that it didn't um, splash and create more problems. And they opted not to remove every single boxwood plant from their property because they all weren't showing those devastating symptoms. Um, they continued to watch for disease, for signs of disease on the plants that remained. Some of them were mature plants that um, looked okay, and others there was a there was a nice hedge around the outside of the property that Jay and I looked at pretty closely, and it had some spots where you could see that the disease was present, but it wasn't anything like what we were seeing on the interior of the property where the whole plant was defoliated. There'd just be little patches, and you could see the lesions, and you could see the the leaves had fallen off, but they were very small patches, and so they just watched them, and I've been watching them since, and that hedge still looks pretty good, so I don't know if they've they planted accidentally in the past a resistant variety. It must be what it is. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, that was that was that particular study or um, case study. And then another big concern we had was uh, just a few miles away on the coast, um, outside of Coos Bay, is a state park called Shore Acres State Park that has a lot of, um, it's a horticultural park. It's beautiful. They do a lot of work there, but it's got, boxwood is a is a fundamental part of their landscape. Um, it's another English type garden. And they get a ton of traffic. Uh, people move through the park every day. There's a lot of people coming through and they come from all over um, the West Coast and all over the country. So the odds of the disease being transmitted there or once, it, if it were to get established there, to be that to that for that to provide a source population um, to move outward was it's just there. So Jay and I visited the park. We met with the park supervisor and um, toured the park, did some surveying to determine if the disease was present there, and it wasn't. So we talked to her about their quarantine program. Jay talked about. Um, how, you know, when you get new plants or whatever, to have them quarantined for a month or so to make sure there's no diseases. They've got, at Shore Acres, they've got a great quarantine program. Um, and we, we um, walked her through, um, helped her understand what, to, to, what symptoms to look for so she could educate her employees, so they could just be keeping an eye out 
eye on it. And um, the goal was just to provide her with the information and tools she would need to minimize their risk of infection happening there. So OSU, like Jay mentioned, had already done a lot of work with the Department of Agriculture and other places around the company, country to uh, develop educational information and classes that targeted the wholesale nursery industry. And I've been, when, when I say that, because that was a new term for me, with, you were talk, talking the big nurseries like they have up in the valley where they grow and sell large numbers of plants and they distribute those to um, smaller community nurseries, right? So those guys had gotten really great education. They really knew what was going on. Um, but as Jay mentioned earlier, he realized through surveys that he took that there was this, this gap in, in understanding. We were missing a whole group of people, and they were a very important group of people, um, homeowners and landscapers, that needed some education and awareness um, of boxwood blight. Uh, and so we wanted to reach as many people as we could sooner rather than later. So we worked with Shore Acres, and there was a, they've got a small nonprofit group called Friends of Shore Acres that um, we developed this little brochure because with the extension, it takes a while to get an official publication out, which is, that's good, and that's fine, but we wanted to get the information out sooner rather than later. So we developed these... Um, these boxwood blight brochures and handed them out at Shore Acres because we knew they'd have a lot of traffic and other places as well. And in the first six months, we got um, around, a they distributed around a thousand of those brochures and then, um, which was fantastic. And in the meantime, we got this, um, our Oregon State University Extension Services publication, we got that all out and going. Um, out on in the world um, for people to access in April of 2016. So this is available from our OSU Extension Service website. You can probably actually type in Beware of Box of Blight into any Google search engine and get and have that pop out. So this information is in there. It's not a very long publication, but um, it's concise and it has information on um, what we talked about today, what Box of Blight is, what it looks like, how it spreads, and how best to manage or prevent it. So those were, those were great, good publications to have out there. Um, and so, you know, whenever you think about any problem, you think, wouldn't it be great if you could take measures to minimize your risk of exposure, or if you could plant um, plants or alternatives to boxwoods that are lower risk for manifesting a disease, or if you could predict outbreaks. And so, you know, those things are available. Those first two points are available um, in the extension publication, information about alternative plants, information about um, how susceptible particular varieties of boxwood are. It's all there. And then we're going to talk through, we've got a model that can help you, um, that, that we can use that Jay alluded to earlier, that, will, uh, that you can use in your own local area to predict um, boxwood blight, your, your risk of infection. So uh, just briefly, we'll run through this. Um, Oregon State University has an Integrated P Plant Protection Center, or IPPC, that's the acronym here of this. Um, on, they have it on campus. It's a, it's a program, and they do a, really, a lot of really amazing work. Uh, this web page that you're looking at has links to some really phenomenal different models that you can play with. Uh, uh, pest and disease models, forecasting models, growing degree phenology models, and then we're going to look at this risk, at this uh, these these plant risk models. Let's see here. What am I got going on here? Didn't I? Oh yeah, I highlighted it. So this is where we're going to go. But there's a lot of stuff on here that you can actually play with and um, explore. It's really great. And um, this is what Jay showed. This is the, the the website that Jay showed earlier. The screenshot. Um, I just wanted to briefly walk through what the risk model output looks like so that you have an idea of what information you will see when you use it. So um, the model takes into account pre precipitation and temperature like we talked earlier and um, and then it gives you some, a date and a time frame. So um, this this graph right here, if you can see my arrow, is, is kind of your risk of infection graph and I circled it, perfect. Um, if we look at this a little bit closer, 
you see um, cumulative growing degree hours on the left hand side of the graph and that's just a measure of, of warmth and uh, the date is along the bottom so I took this particular screenshot on September 26 and it just gives you you know historical and future dates um, the blue lines on the graph represent historical data so what's already been up to that point in time and then the pink lines are, are the forecasted risk which is really nice to be able to see just to give you a ballpark of what what could be happening in the in the future and then if you have question if you forget what those things are there's the legend up there at the top to help you when you look behind the lines you can see things that are written in gray so this first line here says first infection young leaves highly susceptible varieties so when the graft risk lines cross that threshold that's when you have risk of infections on young leaves of highly susceptible varieties so they're going to be the most susceptible at the lowest level and the second line says first infection young leaves of susceptible varieties versus highly susceptible varieties just a just a relative um, measure there so as you move vertically up the grass you can see that the risk of infection is higher um, higher up as farther up the graph graph you go so you know this is a higher risk of course than this down over here pretty obvious but don't want to make any assumptions about how comfortable people are with using graphs so that's why we went through it um, and then just briefly we will go through um, just running this model really quickly and you can see my my little arrow thing right that's good all right so we go to uspest.org um, just really easy to type in and then this third model down is the risk model um, website that we'll be able to go to and because I've been here before um, it's already it remembers that I looked for boxwood blight infection risk before so it's got it here but I just want to run you through um, here's a map this map here is a map that you can manipulate and move around so I'm going to zoom out briefly I'm going to move over into the valley here and uh, in the Portland area and maybe zoom in a little bit each of those little blue dots is a is some sort of a weather station and so you can click on any of these and it'll give you some information some of them don't have the same amount of information as others but um, it, they're, they're there and they can help you hone in better to the area of interest that you have um, when you look down below the map this tells you which uh, which station you selected and so let's pretend I select this one up by Gresham so I've selected that one it gives you gives you a little window that tells you which one it is and then you can go down to these into these um, parameters below here and you can adjust these if you really want to you probably if you're just looking for information right now you wouldn't need to do that but you can adjust the display dates and um, and then the part that you're going to where you're going to need to pick your disease model is right here so the third one down where you select plant disease or other hourly driven models you select that and what's normally going to come up is this so you have fire blight powdery mildew scab and then you're going to select other and then it gives you a whole set of additional things models that you can you can use and look at so here we're looking at box with blight infection risk we click that and we just say refresh click on the refresh key and then up here is your um, your infection risk for the past couple of weeks three weeks or so so you can see how from you know the 17th 16th or so forward until the 21st or 22nd there was a really high risk for infection a rain event must have come through and it was warm warm enough temperatures that there was a very high risk for infection regardless of the age of the boxwood or anything and then since that time there have been periodic small little bursts of um, infectiousness <laughs> that's a word um, uh, and then moving forward pretty not much so if we move down um, I like to look at the coast because I live over here how selfish of me um, if we look at Coos Bay for example um, and we take into account, let's look over here by Millington. 
it was just select this, it, ke it keeps all of our other data here. So we're looking at Foxgrove blind infection risk still. And uh, there's nothing there, and I don't know why. Hmm. Hmm. Let's check this one. Maybe they don't have the right data. So this is from the North Bend Airport. But you can see, like, we don't have, it's a very different picture than what you saw up in the Gresham from that earlier, earlier map. So depending on where you are, you can um, mess around and, and look at different, different um, levels of the risk for your different, whatever area you're in. So Reedsport has had extremely high risk over the last few weeks. And yeah, and so that's just, that's how you use that model. And that was what I wanted to talk to you about today. That's it. Um, I think we've got time for questions. So while people are formulating their questions, um, and again, you can put those into the Q&A box, um, I saw that Jay had answered one, and maybe you could just um, reiterate, Jay, some of the um, mimics for this disease that master gardeners or others might see come into the plant clinic. What could this be confused with? Well, there's a lot of different things that uh, we can uh, find that uh, people will go, oh, it's a blight, and it's causing a problem on my boxwood, and uh, volutella is a biggie, uh, phytophthora is another. Uh, the question that popped in was about uh, dog damage. You know, could a dog, well, let's be more specific, a male dog marking its territory, uh, could that be confused with boxwood blight? And uh, on a casual observation, yeah, maybe, if uh, the dog does it all the time, uh, usually they don't empty their, the males don't um, empty their bladder all the time. It's your mark in territory, but a little bit here, a little bit there, anything on a vertical surface um, will get hit. Uh, if there's rainfall within 24 hours, uh, you won't get damage. Um, this is, yeah, some vet did research on it. I had to look it up uh, on dog damage, but uh, if you take a good close look at the bushes, uh, look for the leaf spots, look for the stem lesions, uh, dog damage won't have that. Um, one question that I had on management, so you had went over the, um, when you're pruning, that you have two sets of, of pruning tools and that while you're using one, the other is, is soaking in a disinfectant. How long do you recommend people soak them for? Is there any minimum time? Uh, rule of thumb would be minutes, depending on the, I mean, it, it may only be seconds for something like bleach. If you have a very clean pruners that you've cleaned all the, the uh, plant juices off of it, it uh, doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, darkening on there. If it's nice and clean, uh, you put it into the bleach, it might not take very long at all. Although it's so hard on them that we usually go to something else like the, the denatured alcohols, but then you have to increase the contact time. And then we're talking minutes. And I think rather than coming up with a, you know, it's got to be exactly 3.5 minutes. No, just let it sit and soak in there. Uh, the longer it's in there, the better uh, kill you're going to get of the organisms. And so while you're pruning away with your other one, that can soak there for a while, and then you can switch them out and let the other one soak uh, while you're pruning something else. It looks like there's just one uh, sort of a follow-up co comment from Robin who said that um, some places they, they actually don't want landscapers to bring in their own tools. They'll just use the tools that are on the site to minimize probably the same thing that you're, that you're mentioning. Yeah, so a landscaper could move it from one landscape to another, and so this is a tactic that uh, if it's not in the landscape already, then that, that would work uh, pretty well. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions in the in the q and A. I just have maybe one question quick for you, Cassie. Have you seen any more spread? And I might have missed this while I was watching the behind the scenes, but have you seen any more instances of this disease in your in your counties, Coos and Curry? I haven't, no. Mm -mm, thankfully. That's great. That's great. All right, folks, so seeing no other questions in there, um, we have a lot of links that are in, in the chat. We'll make sure that those come out. You'll also all be receiving an email that will have a survey on the webinar series and a link to the recording will come out in that as well. And I really um, appreciate all of your uh, attending all these webinar series. 
Oh, it says, what counties in Washington have it been, has it been seen? Uh, and uh, that's a question that just popped up. Uh, I don't know how many counties, but I do know it's in the greater Seattle area in landscapes. There's also a uh, Spanish version of some of the material that Luisa Santa Maria has put together, and that's also available from uh, Extension Communications. Excellent. We'll make sure to get that link out. All right. Well, thank you all so much.